Without further delay, it's my pleasure to pass on the microphone to Elena. Go ahead, Elena. Thank you very much, Rocio. It is a pleasure to have you all joining us today for this first um, webinar of three. And I just want to give you a very brief context to how we came to this to this uh, point of being able to share these ideas with you. During the last six years, a series of organizations around the world came together once and again to discuss the concepts and the ideas of putting concrete budgetary obligations to Article 2 of the Covenant of International Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Together with these groups, we all debated, uh, thought, and arrived at the ideas that are currently encompassed in the handbook called Article 2 and Government's Budget. Especially, I want to pay, uh, point out the, the um, role of the key organizations who were involved in this conceptual development, which was the International Human Rights Internship Program, uh, uh, the Global Movement for Budget Transparency, Accountability, and Participation, Asociación Civil por la Igualdad y la Justicia en Argentina, Centro Internacional por Investigaciones en Derechos Humanos en Guatemala, Fundar Centro de Análisis e Investigación en México, Instituto de Estudios Socioeconómicos en Brasil, and the Public Service Account monitor in South Africa. Together with the International Budget Partnership, we are happy to be able to bring this development of our thinking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. We will now go ahead and start the presentation with Anne Bleiberg. Go ahead, Anne. You can, you can see me okay? We can't see your presentation yet. Okay, thank we, you. cannot. No. We can hear you. No? Now we can. Yes, go ahead. Great. Okay. Uh, so this first webinar is going to focus on the obligation on governments to use the maximum of available resources, and specifically in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Article 2.1. It says, each state party to the present covenant undertakes to take steps, especially economic and technical, to the maximum of its available resources with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of the rights recognized in the pre present covenant by all appropriate means. So that's what we're going to focus on. Um, Rosie, it's not moving. Okay. Uh, so the principal implications of the MAR obligation for government's budgets. In other words, what does MAR mean when we're talking about government's budgets? Uh, It means that governments must mobilize as many resources as possible, give due priority to ESC rights, fully spend ESC rights related allocations, not spend ESC rights allocations on non-ESC rights areas, and spend the budget efficiently and effectively. These are the main points. There are many implications for the budgets from the MAR obligation, but these are the main points that we've derived from it, and this is based on what the, com the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights has said in its general comments, its concluding observations, and so on. 
So now look at each of the bullet points in turn. Mobilize as many resources as possible. What that means is that governments must raise as many resources domestically as possible. This has implications for tax rates, tax collection, and so on. Seek out foreign assistance if that's necessary to meet its ESC rights obligations. And consider taking on debt, but consider the human rights implications both in the short term and in the long term of taking on the debt. Second bullet, give due priority to ESC rights. In broad terms, that means governments must direct funds to ESC rights areas as a matter of priority. In the discussion, we can talk more if you would like to about what due priority means from the perspective of the committee. And it also says that governments must, within ESC rights related areas, give priority to meeting core obligations so that, for instance, related to the right to health, give priority to primary health care. Third bullet, fully spend ESC rights related allocations means governments must, obviously, fully spend funds that have been allocated for ESC rights. And there are many reasons why governments underspend, and when they do, they need to identify the reasons for underspending and do their utmost to correct the problems. Next bullet, must not spend ESC rights related allocations on non-ESC rights areas, which means that governments must, during the fiscal year, not divert funds from ESC rights areas, so that if they've allocated funds to ESC rights issues, they can't move those funds at spending. They can't spend that money on some other area during the fiscal year. And then within ESC rights areas, not divert funds from priority to non-priority expenditures. So don't spend, again, primary care funds for tertiary care, that sort of example. And then finally, spend the budget efficiently and effectively. This has many implications. The chief ones are that governments must purchase goods and services that are reasonably priced and of good quality, getting bang for the buck. Avoid corruption. Corruption, the committee has said, is an inefficient use of expenditures, if that wasn't obvious already. And spend funds on items that more directly realize ESC rights. In the handbook, there's a Sakika case study that explains in some detail uh, a case that Sakika worked on that's a very good illustration of this point. And then finally, spend funds in a way that has the effect of enhancing people's rights. In other words, that's effective enhancing people's rights. And this is the PPR case study that we're going to go to now, but one more slide. So this is the link to the full handbook. So before we go on to PPR, if you haven't looked at the whole handbook, that's the link to the handbook. Um, and we would certainly encourage you to do that. Thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Ward. Kate is with the Participation and Practice of Rights in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And PPR works in incredibly creative ways with communities in Belfast whose rights are being violated. Kate, to you. Thank you very much. Um, um, as Anne mentioned, um, the issue that I would like to focus on today is um, the case study from uh, the handbook, which is really on, um, I'm not sure, can you see my screen? Not yet. Great. Um, so the issue that I would like to focus on is the case study from the handbook, which is on the Seven Towers project, um, which is a block of flats in Belfast uh, in Northern Ireland, and specifically on the government proposal to install PVC cladding to the exterior of the towers. Before getting to the... What's happening here? Oh, yeah, okay. Before getting to the cladding proposal itself, um, it's maybe important to start by introducing the Seven Towers and the problems faced by residents living there. The Seven Towers flats in North Belfast were thrown up in the 1960s as a response to increased housing need in the area. The, condi the conditions since then have deteriorated sharply. The area that the flats are located in is one of the areas most acutely affected by the conflict here and has not reaped the benefits of any economic boom which resulted from investment generated by the peace process. 
By that I mean that in the 15 years since the peace accord was signed, this area of North Belfast has continued to occupy the top spots in official government deprivation statistics across a number of indices. So high rates of unemployment, poor health outcomes, educational disadvantage, and of course housing need. Crucial to the understanding of this case is also the fact that added to this disadvantage is the fact that demand for social housing in North Belfast has consistently outstripped supply over the years. The result of this has been that people have been forced to remain in unsuitable housing for very long periods of time. You can see on screen some of the examples of this unsuitable housing. So chief amongst the residents and the issues faced by the residents was really dampness and mould and inefficient heating systems which produced very little heat and cost far too much money to run. Just to talk a little bit about our approach, the Seven Towers residents began working with PPR back in 2006. Our approach is a participative rights-based model which ensures that primacy is placed on vulnerable groups identifying issues affecting their right to housing for themselves. Our role here is to equip and empower them to do so and then to support the alignment of these issues to international human rights obligations. So it's about putting technical expertise at the service of the most vulnerable. For the Seven Towers residents, what this meant was the development of human rights indicators and benchmarks. We were very conscious that if human rights are to be real, there has to be evidence of change on the ground. I'll show you what I mean. By articulating dampness, for example, as a human rights issue, Seven Towers residents were able to bring about a fundamental shift in their relationship with government. Now the conversation was to be about rights and obligations, no longer about individual needs and requests for assistance. Using human rights indicators was also important in that it helped build an evidence base about the extent of the problems faced by rights holders. In in 2011, for example, residents were able to show that 45% of the people who lived in the towers had had problems with dampness over the previous two years, and that 89% were unhappy with the heating. Moving on to the cladding proposal itself. Having such a clear evidence base about the manner and extent of potential abuse of economic and social rights was really, really important in assessing proposed government investment in the Seven Towers. In 2007, the government body with responsibility for social housing announced plans to install PVC plastic cladding to the exterior of the Seven Towers. Essentially, for anyone unfamiliar with cladding terminology, what they wanted to do was to hitch a giant raincoat to the outside of the building. The investment would cost £7 million and the residents, despite their work to make visible the issues they faced, were not to be involved in the development of the plans. The economic appraisal for the cladding revealed that the government's priorities here were ostensibly about upgrading the health and safety of the buildings, providing accommodation to meet the needs of the residents and reducing costs relating to future maintenance. When examined closely, however, there was no evidence that the plans would meaningfully address these objectives, especially those in relation to meeting the needs of the residents. Under scrutiny from the residents, the housing executive, the body in charge of housing here, conceded that the plans were not about addressing problems with poor heating and dampness. To be very honest, this was power for the core, an indicative of a pattern of government spending which reflected a decision-making structure which excluded residents and their issues. In the previous 10 years, for example, we were able to find out that the total spend on maintenance in the Seven Towers had been over £3 million. Despite this, none of the spending had been directed at improving the heating or targeting the dampness problem. This, in and of itself, was certifiable proof that the residents' exclusion from the decision-making process had resulted in spending targeted in the wrong, or at least in more ineffective, areas. At this stage, I suppose the key thing was what we knew. 
What we knew was that the cladding was not about progressing the housing rights of the Seven Towers residents. It was about protecting the building. What we needed to find, find out, however, was how much it would cost to make an investment that would produce not only the right outcome, but rights-based outcomes. Thinking about how to go about this in terms of measuring government expenditure against how it guarantees rights really, really simplified what could have felt like a massively complicated task of a set of streams for non-economists. A key rights issue, for example, that we were concerned with was the fact that 89% of residents were unhappy with heating. Despite the poor heating system the residents had, they were very aware from their family and friends and neighbours living in other areas that there was a government heating replacement system replace, replacing the Economy 7 heating, which is what the residents had, with a more efficient gas-based heating system. We needed to find out how much it would cost to install this system in the Seven Towers, and we needed to make an economic argument that there was a much better alternative. Knowing exactly what information we needed really simplified the process of finding it. We were able to find out the cost of converting to a more efficient and effective heating system and the monetary savings resulting from this change. Using this information, we were able to estimate the total cost of upgrading the heating system in all 384 of the flats in the towers would cost under £2 million. This would not only directly improve the resident's satisfaction with their heating, but would also go some way to improving the damp and wool problem, not to mention the knock-on effect this would have on the health and well-being of the people living in the towers. Critically, we were also able to estimate that on an annual basis, the combined savings to the residents would be around £74,000. The residents' budget analysis had shown that not only was there an alternative that would be much more effective in guaranteeing rights, but it would also cost less than the government proposal. In fact, the residents' proposal would cost less than a third of that which was being proposed by the government. Moving on to the results. The first thing I should say is that the Minister with Responsibility for Housing refused the residents' proposal. He accepted that the cladding plans in their current form weren't perfect, but told the residents that if he was them, he would be happy with half a loaf rather than none at all. That said, there were some very, very clear victories. Firstly, the agenda had been changed. Resident identified rights issues like heating and dampness were now visible and on the agenda. They were the litmus test against which government proposals were being assessed. Critically, despite the Minister's attitude, the residents were also able to force the plans to slow down, and through their evidence, the strategic use of press, campaigning techniques, and powerful international allies, the residents forced a review of the plans. New plans were issued with improvements, such as insulation, which was directly related to the issue of heat. The other important thing is that this tool removed the veto power of government. For too long, government could say that residents' proposals were not economical. Now residents were speaking their language and knew that their proposals didn't add up. I know that I'm running out of time, but I'd like to leave you with some, before I leave you with some key points, I wanted just to show you this. It's a quote from Mary Robinson, who at the moment is the UN Special Envoy for Climate Change. Very often, the challenge to government decision making, especially when it's about resource allocation and expenditure, is viewed as bullshy and obstreperous. Indeed, these were some of the accusations levelled at the residents. Holding government to account for rights and testing their expenditure proposals in this manner, however, is neither of these things. Specifically referring to the work of the residents in the Seven Towers, Mary Robinson said that this process creates tension but it's a healthy tension, necessary for, for the creation of a healthy democracy, which is about ensuring public decisions are taken on the basis of transparency, accountability, and participation, which ensures that it leads to outcomes for the most marginalized. The last thing I wanted to show you today is some key points, which if you remember nothing else about this presentation, please let these be the points you take away. 
from our experience, the key things to remember is that you need to involve the right people. It sounds very, very simple, but it is often overlooked. The participation of the affected group is essential. They have the expertise. Measure the right things. Developing an evidence base as to the extent of economic and social and cultural rights failing is critical to both assessing the effectiveness of government expenditure and challenging it. The last thing is keep it simple. If you're doing one and two, then three should follow naturally. But there is a temptation to get lost in confusing budget streams, and in my experience, keeping it simple gives it added impact. Rothio, can I hand back to you? Yes, thank you very much, Kate. Um, well, now we will uh, officially open the, um, the floor to questions and answers. So please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question, or you can use the chat box below to type questions for our presenters. Uh, we had very informative um, presentation, so I'm sure there will be uh, comments from the floor. How do you keep things simple with budget matters? Budgets are usually complicated to deal with. This is a question from Sylvain Aubrey. Anne, Elena, or Kate, you are able to speak. If anybody wants yes. to take that first question, go ahead. I'm happy to take it, Rocio. Go ahead. Um, the, the matter with budgets is that the budgets themselves are complicated. But if you have clarity about what it is that you want budgets to tell you, and what your questions are to go into a search, uh, you will be able to keep things simple. It doesn't mean that the work that you has, have to do to understand the budget uh, will be simple, but you will have clarity about what you're looking for, which is a key of what Kate was saying, and you will have the clarity needed to then frame what you found in the simplest term possible to connect to the needs of what people have on the ground and to the arguments that have to be uh, furthered with government officials. Thank you, Elena. Diego de la Mora from Mexico is asking what kind of budget analysis did you do, Kate? What is the level of detailed information in Ireland and how did you use it? Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, I think the first thing to say is that we didn't intentionally start off wanting to do budget analysis. Rather, it was um, a, another tool that we used in an ongoing campaign. Um, so it was about um, looking at um, the campaign that the residents um, were um, taking on um, in terms of the realization of their rights. And it became very important for the residents to start looking at the economic argument being put forward by the government um, because they weren't winning when it came to the other arguments or at least they weren't making as much impact as they could have done. Um, in terms of the information which was available, um, yes, um, there is quite a lot of information um, available, um, but often it's very difficult to get it. Um, and that's something that we have increasingly found um, in terms of our work um, at PPR across a number of different um, subject areas that whilst we do have um, legislation such as freedom of information legislation and um, governments are becoming much more hostile and much more reluctant to give that information because people are using information as power in terms of um, their use of tools like budget analysis. Thank you Kate. Karen Ben Zeev is um, asking whether also to Kate whether uh, in your project article too was it specifically referred to. I don't know if this is um, clear enough, Karen. If if you don't mind, you can ask. Uh, I can unmute you and you can ask your question. K 
Karen, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I was just referring to whether Article 2, whether the, referring to Article 2 was a specific line in the campaign or a way of engaging with decision makers. Okay. Kate? Yeah, uh, definitely, 100%. Um, the human, I suppose the way that I have, uh, that I presented here is um, to try and make it um, more real in terms of the, the work that the residents were doing on the ground. But the human rights indicators and benchmarks that I touched very briefly on um, are very directly um, linked to um, Article 2, which is about, obviously, um, the progressive realization of rights. So when we talk about dampness um, and heating, for example, the residents initially um, survey other residents and develop a baseline as to the extent of the problem. And then they set targets for government to meet over the course of a monitoring period, so say a year, that government should be able to demonstrate that they are specifically um, taking steps um, to the maximum available resources um, to progressively realize these rights. So there should be improvement. And in the resident surveys, this should be demonstrated. Um, so whenever we looked at the budget analysis, um, it was very clear um, to us that the budget analysis tool that we developed um, was directly linked to the indicators and benchmarks. So it was an extension of that process. Um, for the residents. There is more information about it on our website um, as well, which is www.pprproject.org. Um, and my email um, was on the screen, or I'm happy to um, give it out as well, and I'd be happy to follow up with you if, you if you would like more information on our use of Article 2 as well. Kate, would you mind putting that in the chat box so that everybody can get it? Sure. And I'm going to go ahead and read two more questions. I don't see any hands up. Again, feel free to raise your hand and I'll pass on the microphone so we can hear other voices. Um, for now, I'll read two questions from the floor. Again, Sylvain Aubrey. Uh, she asks, do you have any tip to find budget information, in particular in developing countries? where information is often not readily available, or when they are, even if you know what you are looking for, it may not be easy to find. And the next question from Anna Schnell is, when you discussed what definitions of maximum extent of available resources and progressive realization to use in the handbook, I guess this is for Anne, were there discussions around other points than those who included than those now included in the handbook? That is, other points that you choose to leave out? If so, which ones and why? Kate and Anne, you can go ahead. Um, um, Rocio? Yes? Uh, I was thinking of, of jumping into the question of how to find information in developing countries. Go ahead. Um, I think that the main challenge for finding information in developing countries is the resistance that, uh, that we often face from government officials that do not want to feel uh, being under scrutiny by uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, information exists depending on the country, to varying degrees, but it is a fact-finding mission. It is the effort of trying to understand the problem that you are addressing to what kind of government intervention or what level of government intervention or what sectorial intervention or programmatic intervention it is related. Mm -hmm. And then trying to find the information that gives the frame for what the government should be doing, which often is not budget information, but programmatic information, and then trying to find the related numbers or the budget information that comes in with that. So this is often, uh, besides a fact-finding mission, it is also a somehow evolving dialogue with government officials in order to understand 
what is available and how we can get hold of what it what is available and it is often also a long road because uh, the willingness to hand over information is limited most of the time and the the steps to get us to what we need are many and we not necessarily know them from the beginning on now if there is a provision relating to the right to access information if there is a freedom of information act then that definitely helps in a very important ways because it gives us a perspective it gives us a door sorry of in order to request information ask government to give what they have in terms of budgetary information and uh, proceed accordingly. Still, if there is an access to information law, it is often difficult for common citizens to know what has to be asked. Mm -hmm. So the road that I described prior, priorly in order to identify what government level or government program or action the problem specifically is related to in order to fine-tune your questions within an access to information frame is very important. Lastly, and the International Budget Partnership has uh, the Open Budget Survey which currently looks at more than 100 countries and gives an overview of the kinds of information that are available in each of these countries. I think that if you have uh, the OBS for your country it is worth to look into the detailed survey responses for the specific country in order to understand what kind of information is available and where it can be found. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, address Anna Schnell's um, question about what we included and what we didn't include. There was a lot, Anna, that we did not include um, in the handbook because the handbook, we really wanted to make it uh, simple and accessible and that also means, as you know, I'm sure from your own experience, relatively short so that people don't get bogged down in pages and pages and pages. And I think the uh, and our idea was to give examples of, um, of what the implications might be of MAR for government's budgets and sort of the most important ones. But for instance, in the handbook, we didn't discuss revenue a great deal. And yet MAR has huge implications for revenue. I mentioned earlier tax rates, for instance, um, choices about that governments make um, in terms of the rate at which they tax, what they tax, who they tax, how they tax, and so on. Um, there's a lot on the revenue side, on natural resources, all of those questions. There's a lot on the revenue side that we didn't talk a lot about in the handbook. But I also want to stress this is an ongoing process um, that it, we didn't sit around and look at those words really, really hard and say, what does maximum available resources mean? I think what we learned was that the organizations that have been involved and other organizations in doing the budget work um, came across, uh, developed findings that, that had significant implications that were definitely connected to this government obligation. I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, I was in South Africa, and there was a discussion going on. And they were talking about asset management. In other words, the government has these various assets. So suppose you have uh, machines that clean latrines. And the government doesn't maintain those machines. And so the latrines don't get cleaned because the government is failing to allocate money to keep the machines working. That failure of asset management is arguably a failure to use a maximum of available resources because those machines are resources, but they're not being used efficiently and effectively to realize people's rights to sanitation in that case. And that was, a, again, that was sort of like, oh, this is a, a learning in the process, just talking with people about different issues that they've encountered that relate to the government's budget. We're, we're developing an increasingly elaborate and sophisticated understanding of what the implications are of this obligation. And the, the, this obligation is a very, very powerful obligation 
um, that I think the more we get into, the more organizations get into digging into the government's budget and looking at that obligation, realize that it is very powerful. Thank you very much, Anne. I'll now give the word to our colleague Yogesh Kumar from India. Go ahead, Yogesh, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Harina and uh, Kate. It was a very interesting presentation uh, you provided about uh, the engagement of a uh, uh, resident of a particular uh, uh, housing uh, colony and how they could really uh, empower themselves to talk to each of the government. So this is very interesting case uh, I really uh, enjoyed uh, listening to and also the framework provided. Uh, I think uh, I would like to elaborate a little more what Helena mentioned that in uh, most of the underdeveloped uh, countries or developing countries, empowering citizens with knowledge and information is extremely important and challenging task. Uh, right to information as you mentioned uh, has been enacted in many of the countries but uh, when the information is provided by the government it cannot be deciphered by them. Therefore, sure. there is a role of the civil society to uh, see that how it could be done. The economic analysis, as you mentioned, has mm -hmm. to be supported by the civil society organizations in the business. I think we also need to look at number of tools which can help people identify their own issues in a more, uh, I would say, systematic manner that they can dialogue with. Whether it is social audit, citizens report cards, uh, consultations, that also become an equally important part uh, in this whole process. I'll just give a simple example uh, 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 how, as you said, the maximum budgets are being uh, misused or uh, affected in India. Uh, there is a more provision of resources for construction of school buildings than uh, provision for hiring teachers. So ultimately you have infrastructure but you don't have uh, the trained teachers who can teach. Uh, it is under the uh, Right to Education Act, but that's what the situation is. And there could be a number of such examples. So I, I read the, uh, the book also, it's, it's very useful. And uh, so these are a few observations. So, so how do you, my question is that, uh, do you consider empowering uh, citizens with different tools also essential part of it? And what would be the expertise available within the civil society that can connect with the people to give them uh, analysis. Uh, that's I would like to put forward. But thank you. It was very wonderful listening. Thank you, Yogesh. Thank you, Yogesh. That was very interesting. Um, I first of all, I totally agree with <laughs> everything that you said. Um, it's been my role within PPR is a policy and research role um, primarily, but. Also, I'm very fortunate to have colleagues who have um, a development background who would work um, extensively with um, residents in order really to get to that process. Um, it's the development of skills, the development, the use of a variety of different tools. Um, and that goes right back to um, you know someone who initially doesn't want to talk about their housing, um, doesn't want to take any steps at all. Um, you know, women, I've met with women who didn't want to talk about dampness in their home because they were embarrassed. Um, right up to people having a very, very bad experience of interaction with government bodies um, who often blame them for the problems that they had in their own housing. Um, so how do you move from that position to a position where you have activists who are questioning government um, on a range of issues that previously they were unfamiliar with. And part of that is about um, looking at the role of Article 2 um, in comparison with the role of other human rights principles. So looking at um, the obligation to ensure that um, rights holders can meaningfully participate in decisions which are made. Um, so looking at the provision of information and remembering that government not only have an obligation to provide information, but to provide information in a manner which is accessible to people um, so that they can make informed decisions um, about their rights. One of the other um, streams of work that we do in PPR is with mental health service users and carers. And they, in their work, they have um, been really um, 
focused on the issue of participation and the issue of assessing information provided by government and they have developed some participation indicators so they measure the information provided by government against a set of international human rights standards um, and then report back to government and request changes based upon that to ensure that they can participate so that could be one of the tools that people could use um, there's some more information about the participation indicators and the work that we do in mental health on our website as well um, and there there's been a few um, academic articles written on it as well, which I'm happy to signpost people to. Um, but in terms of um, the wider issues, in terms of the sector, how do we pass on that expertise to people? I think that's something that, broadly speaking, we are learning and is necessary in terms of even today's webinar, looking at best practice examples elsewhere um, and translating that into tools that can be used in our own societies. Um, certainly that's been something that PPR have done. We've always looked outside of what's happening here for examples of what's worked well, well elsewhere and borrowed from there and adapted. Um, so I think just continue doing that. I don't know if Anne or Helena have any thoughts on that as well. Anne or Helena, would you like to add anything? Um, uh, yes, just uh, briefly to add, this is work in progress for all of us. I mean, even those of us who have spent many years trying to activate participation and to make citizens empowered by their rights and by the power of information itself, I mean, we always continue learning how it can happen how it can gel and what it can bring. So, um, I mean, the best, uh, the best, uh, the best recipe is just to continue doing it, and to be exposed to other stories and other approaches and other struggles in order to understand what to do out of them. And this is part of what we wanted to achieve with this handbook uh, by focusing primarily on the stories of the groups and how they used information and how they used the budget and how they did several steps in order to get to where they are, which is a, an emphasis that the handbooks have, which is trying to define the different moments or steps and choices uh, that happened along the road. So it is, uh, I mean, there is nothing like practice, and this definitely applies to this question as well. Thank you, Elena. Well, we'll continue moving on. There is a question from Pia Janning. Regarding maximum available resources and taxation, in Ireland we have a very low corporation tax rate. International experts such as the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights would say that MAR, maximum available resources, would allow, for example, increases in corporation tax. The Irish government would argue that this would deter investment in Ireland, which in turn would have knock-on effects in terms of employment. How would you address this? That is, I mean, that's definitely one of the questions that comes up. I mean, that, and again, I, there is like the Center on Economic, Social, and Co Economic and Social Rights gets involved a lot on, on issue the macroeconomic issues in terms of choices of. Um, taxation regimes and so on, um, and but I think the the in terms of the human rights obligations, um, it's it it may be it may be I mean it's not we're not saying that maximum available resources means that you have to tax corporations at the highest level possible. It's simply that means that you need to um, the governments need to over a sustained period of time ensure that the maximum available resources the maximum resources are available to direct to human rights. Um, and so in this case where they argue that the investment would increase employment, et cetera, et cetera, this is a question of evidence. If that's the case, then provide the evidence because certainly we would be, obviously, it would be great if there were more employment, but it, 
what, what is the evidence for that, showing the evidence, who would be employed, um, what would be the other effects of not increasing um, the taxation. So I think it's an evidence issue there um, and the, the obligation on the government to produce the evidence and show that in fact by, by choosing this particular macroeconomic approach that they will be maximizing the benefits um, for economic and social rights. Anything else on this question? Okay. I'm going to give the word to Lisbeth Steer, who's raised a um, hand. Go ahead. We can hear you. Yes, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, great. Um, thank you so much. This has been a really fascinating discussion. I had a question um, that's maybe a little bit more high level. Um, I, I certainly could see the real power of taking on a very specific issue like Kate was um, uh, presenting there. My question relates to whether the Article 2 and what people have been discussing here has or could have an impact on sort of overall budget discussions and overall allocations and whether what, what it concretely means to give priority to ESC rights. And the reason why I raise this is because um, I work at Brookings a lot on education finance issues and there's a lot of discussion within the education community, for example, around whether it is even possible to set uh, financial targets or budget targets for spending on education. Um, and we do a lot of work also more nitty-gritty on where the money is going and whether it's reaching the poor and so on, which you can also do. But can we say anything about um, how much government should spend on those ESC rights uh, in a sort of aggregate? And I was wondering whether that had been uh, discussed and whether uh, the group had come to the conclusion that actually you can't really do this, but it would be good to, to get some views on that. Um, yeah, that's been discussed. It's been discussed over the years, not only by the group of organizations that worked on this, but obviously other groups that are trying to look at um, human rights and budgets and so on. And I think that gets back also to this issue of, well, what does the committee mean by due priority, <laughs> which is a very vague term. Um, and and, I, and I, the committee is not made up of economists, and so they say due priority um, and not necessarily uh, from a, a perspective of informed economics. Um, but I, in, in, our, in our work um, on those broader scale um, issues, in fact, there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, difference in terms of the issues that, that you, you're talking about and looking at it from a human rights perspective. I think in this case, uh, it would be a question of um, making sure that the human rights framework is the framework that the governments are responding to, that, that they, have, they have these obligations. And so, for instance, the Committee on Economic and Social Rights, when they've talked about due priority, they'll give a few examples. They say, for instance, one of the ways that they themselves will assess whether a government in its, in its report to them is um, giving due priority, say for instance to education, um, they will look at sort of international benchmarks that might have been identified um, or regional benchmarks coming for instance from the Abuja Declaration or other declarations mm -hmm. and so on, regional agreements. Um, they will look at uh, what is being spent on education in comparably situated countries um, so that if you are Guatemala they might look at um, Honduras or El Salvador or whatever um, to see. In other words, they themselves recognize that, that due priority is vague, um, but on the other hand, they are trying to sort of pin it down. Um, so, but again, I think that, that it, the, the calculations that people looking at education financing would look at are exactly the sorts of very useful calculations and the very useful sorts of questions that have a real bearing on whether a government is meeting its obligations. Certainly when we were looking and trying to analyze more what MAR meant 
I myself did quite a bit of reading from whether it was Brookings or the World Bank and so on, um, recognizing that a lot of the issues that you're concerned about are exactly, they go to issues of, if you look at the right to education, um, availability, accessibility, non-discrimination, and so on. Um, where are the resources going? Who's benefiting from the resources? What is the quality of the education? It isn't enough that um, more classrooms are being built. Where are the teachers? What's the quality of the education that's being provided? And so on. So the standards of availability, accessibility, both physical and economic, um, quality, culturally acceptable, and so on. Those are human rights standards. And then the question is, you know, if you look at the budget, how does that shake out in terms of the government directing resources to ensuring availability, ensuring accessibility, non-discrimination, and so on? Thank you very much. Karen, I saw your hand was up. Do you still have a question? Raise your hand. If not, we'll move on to the questions written on the chat box. Okay. Um, Sylvain uh, comments on two topics, uh, on taxation and then on the definition of expenditures on non-essential items. She uh, says on the question on taxation, I wonder whether the issue of non Retrogression can be helpful. Also, whether making sure that the taxation is progressive may be a bottom line all governments have to fulfill. And she continues on. This is a question for Anne. How do you define expenditures on non-essential non items? For instance, for education, expenses toward teachers' salaries are often above 90% of the expenses on education. Some think it's too much. Some think it's normal or too little. Are, these, are there principles that we can draw from in Article 2 to have guidance on this, or is it more ad hoc? It can differ from a right to another and from a situation to another. On that last question, um, that's absolutely Right, it does vary. Um, I think it's it's really really essential to know your issue. You know, if you're working at, in the education area, to know what the issues are. If you're working in a particular community or a particular country on education, to know what the issues are there, because you can't look at the budget by itself. You have to look at the budget in context. So, in a certain context, ninety percent of the budget going to salaries may be appropriate. In other contexts, it may not be. If, for instance, um, there's a good, uh, there, if, the, if the classrooms are really crowded um, and you uh, need more buildings, then maybe 90% going to salaries is not the appropriate balance, but it really depends. I mean, education is very staff heavy. I mean, you have teachers. Um, so it's not, there is no, um, there is no, the, the human rights doesn't give you a formula. Human rights gives you a framework and standards. So I think when we were talking about, for instance, non-essentials earlier, it was it was looking at um, things like uh, if if you look at the ratio, for instance, of actual say teaching staff as opposed to administrative staff, or if you're looking and how heavy is the administrative staff as a share of the budget. And in that particular context, knowing the situation, um, are there a sufficient number of administrators or um, are there uh, too few? Um, you really need to know the context to understand what the figures are that you're looking at. And also we were thinking more about um, things like money going to expensive new cars or sending people uh, flying off to workshops here and there that they don't necessarily meet, need, which um, and it's not particularly helpful to increasing the quality of education in the classroom. But again, it's knowing the situation um, uh, very well and then looking at the budget in that context. Anything else on this? Point, Kate or Elena. Participants are also asking for materials. Menakshi asks, is asking, um, can you share a case study initiating this, uh, that discusses how um, a campaign is initiated bottom up, a budget advocacy campaign? 
And Sunita also has a material question. She is interested to learn uh, more on community accountability and mental health. She says, I am interested in maximum available resources and mental health. Is there any organization working on this? And I guess this is a question open to all the, all the participants. Um, Rocio, can I jump in on the case study of a bottom-up campaign? Definitely. Um, <clears throat> and then the IPP has been developing throughout the last years a series of case studies which are called from uh, learn, which are from action to impact or learning for impact and they are available on the on the website, it is like, on the IBP website, it is like the first banner that appears which talks about these case studies. I want to give one specific example that um, I think talks exactly to what the question was posing, um, which is the example of the work of the Social Justice Coalition in South Africa. The Social Justice Coalition started looking at um, sanitation in uh, the townships around Cape Town because they were reaching out, I mean they are a mass-based organization working specifically in Kailicha and they were gathering information from the residents about the dangers of using the portable toilets that serve as toilets in these facilities, uh, sorry, in these townships. Um, for those of you not familiar to South Africa, uh, townships often do not have uh, uh, toilets in each of the houses, but they have uh, a toilets in specific places where everybody has to walk towards these facilities in order to relieve themselves. So um, what they were gathering from the communities was the problem with these, uh, uh, with these conditions because often some of the toilets that were closer to uh, the houses were not working well and thus uh, people had to walk longer distances at night and this led to a series of dangers like uh, uh, being attacked or um, being raped in the case of women while going to the toilet. So uh, they started looking at what the government's obligation was in terms of maintaining these facilities and started uncovering a series of problems ranging from the fact that the there was no money allocated to maintain these facilities uh, all the way to the fact that once the money was allocated it, the, the, uh, the job of maintaining the, the, the toilets was handed out to uh, private companies who were not uh, uh, taking care of all the toilets, who were not taking care of them in the frequency that they should, etc. So this a battle is going on, um, but it came out of a very concrete problem at the community level and has been filtering upwards in order to identify the budget issues and the systemic issues that are involved in the problem and that have to be corrected in order to address it. With regard to the organization working on mental health and using maximum available resources, I'm not familiar with any. I mean, I know that in the area of health generally, there is an increasing um, use among a number of organizations of the human rights framework to look at issues of health and the budgets, but not specifically mental health, um, though I, I imagine some of the experiences from the, the broader health area might be relevant to the mental health area. It's also an issue that's um, 
in the media in the U.S. Uh, these days, the, um, the resources allocated to, uh, to mental health, um, especially at early ages in, in, in life, um, budget groups in the U.S. focusing on health would be a, a resource, but I, I don't have a, a name, but I know it's something that is, is um, very actively discussed these days in the U.S. But not from a human rights framework. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Matthew Niamwange, given the case study, what would be the simplest way to translate human rights needs to national values that will inform the necessary government principles of allocation? I'll read a few questions and then we, we can group them and then you can um, answer them. Um, again, Sylvain Aubrey, in follow-up to my question, and also follow up with the taxation issue. One issue with Article 2 is that when we apply it in practice, people can argue two opposite policies, which they say they do in the name of Article 2. For instance, some people may say raising taxes is in line with Article 2, and other people will make the exact opposite argument. Both will use evidence, but different evidence. Same with the expenses of teachers, administrations, etc. What's the solution on this? That's, I think that's a great question. Um, and um, yeah, if you don't mind, I'll just con I'll, I'll read. A, or if you want to react to this to this uh, points, and then we'll we'll group uh, a couple other questions. Go ahead, presenters. Um, on Matthew's question, um, I'm not sure I'm answering or speaking to it directly, but I think that one of the, probably the principal challenge that we've faced over the years and that any, any of you who've used the human rights framework with budgets have faced is that governments have not historically thought of human rights and budgets as related. And so um, the, I think one of the, the, the central sort of objectives that we have is for, um, for governments and people when they think about the government's budget to think immediately about human rights, that government budgets are all about human rights, that they're integrally related, that um, budgets are essential to realizing human rights, and human rights framework is essential to um, shaping government revenue decisions, allocations, and expenditures. So basically, translating into a national value is simply, from my perspective, is simply um, arriving at the point where um, through conversations, through talking about budgets and human rights as if they're integrally related, so that arriving at the point where people do accept that yes, human rights are all about budgets and budgets are all about human rights. And, and from there then you, know, you take the, take the uh, standards that have been developed and, and translate that um, in discussions with governments in terms of what it means. Um, but yeah, I think that's a very important um, question. Um, in terms of the taxation, uh, I want to speak to the. Go, go ahead. And, uh, no, 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 no. The, you go, and I will deny. Okay. On the taxation question, I, yes, you you can get arguments on both sides. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. that's fine. That's great. Um, the, because Article Two does not. It's not a blueprint. Article Two sets certain standards, and participation and information are key um, to decision making. And so when you have evidence on one side and evidence on another, Article 2 is not going to um, say you know, that, that certain evidence um, fits Article 2 and some de doesn't. It really depends on the soundness of the evidence um, and, and it's a democratic process, back and forth discussion about um, what the evidence says. And then looking at what the evidence says and, and challenging the evidence and bringing forth other evidence or calling on governments to bring forth other evidence and then using the Article 2 framework to assess the evidence. So yes, there's all sorts of evidence out there um, and, and, the, and a lot of these issues are complicated and they, need, they do get into a lot of evidence. Um, but again, uh, the human rights standards are um, and not a blueprint, but a way to assess the evidence that's available. Elena. 
just to add uh, to add to this that you were saying, Anne, I mean, I think that what is important is to understand that numbers can always be used for arguments that are opposing. I mean, uh, depending on what you want to shed light on, you can manipulate numbers in different ways. But ultimately, what it is about here is that too often when you raise the issue about tax reforms, there is only one side being presented or being defended. And uh, what we need is ultimately, as Anne was saying, a multiplicity of evidence or arguments in order to be able to know what the different visions or perspectives on the same issue are and what it means depending on what you want to stress or underscore. So uh, if you have a tax reform that is only good for um, big companies, then what you would have to demonstrate is why this tax reform that benefits big companies will actually bring about something that equals off the, the loss of not getting more resources in. And these discussions are not too often had. So it is, it is an effort to continue pushing the discussion and the arguments ahead and to therefore having more and more elements for engaging and for questioning the rationality of some of these issues. Yes, just to, um, if I could just come in there, Rothio, um, just Absolutely. to reiterate, um, just to reiterate uh, what Helena has said there, um, that it's about um, examining the evidence and measuring the impact. There was a question earlier around uh, the corporation tax in Ireland. In the north of Ireland, um, we're actually having the opposite discussion because the, our politicians want us to lower um, the corporation tax um, so that we can compete with uh, the levels of corporation tax in the south so that, gov er, so that companies will locate here and create jobs. But, um, and that sounds like a very convincing economic argument, but when you actually interrogate um, the information around it and when you look at government job creation based on um, the resources that they currently have, it's very, very clear that um, jobs actually aren't being created in areas um, where they're most needed. For example, um, in some of the areas that we work in, in North and West Belfast, um, there have been consistently the highest rates of unemployment. So one of the, one of the things that I would add to um, the discussion is just that when we're talking about looking at the evidence and we are talking about measuring the impact of government decision making, I think it's really important to measure the impact um, on the most vulnerable because that is where also where the human rights um, obligation is, um, even in times of resource constraint, that government, um, you know, uh, protect vulnerable groups. Um, and I think often that is overlooked. So whenever we're talk, whenever we are asking governments to um, give us evidence about how their proposals or how their government expenditure um, will meet um, international human rights. Um, one of the litmus tests that I think um, that we should be asking them to provide evidence on is um, how their proposals will advance the rights, protect the rights of the most vulnerable, those who are experiencing the most inequality and those who are suffering the most dis disadvantage. Thank you, Kate. There's a few more questions from the floor. There's one on gender budgeting and one on maternal mortality. Yogesh asks if there is an example of government in developing countries designing budgets on economic social rights like gender budgeting. And um, Emmanuel Camonio asks, what can be done to ensure governments use human rights lens to reduce maternal mortality? We have already the Abuja Declaration, a 15% budget allocated to health. Unfortunately, few governments have met the percentage requirement. We have MDGs 4 and 5. Few governments are closer to these targets. What can be done? Would you like to react to uh, those questions? 
Uh, on the first one, uh, governments designing um, budgets on socioeconomic rights, I'm wondering whether um, we might be able to call in Diego de la Mora on um, Fundar's um, experience with the Mexico City government. Diego, would you be keen to speak up? Uh, sorry, I was away for a second. Can you repeat the The question, um, Diego, was that there was a question from Yogesh Kumar. Is there an example of government in developing countries designing budgets on socioeconomic rights? Um, and then I thought of the Mexico City experience and thought maybe um, you might be able to speak to that. All right. Uh, what happened with the uh, Mexico City was that one of the kick was to develop a, uh, a human rights budget or a human rights uh, budget approach. And so what we tried to do was to uh, develop the action lines of the program and to mix them with the activities that the government already had in their uh, uh, in their budget programs. It was a really difficult task and our approach was that if we wanted to really build a human rights uh, budget we, we needed to to address all of the of the lines of the program and put them into the public policies of the of the federal district uh, government, and uh, the the result of that was that we worked with a lot of the institutions of the government, and some of them took the the advice and tried to change their policies and how they did things but most of them did not and at the end what they uh, end up doing was that they saw the budget that it, as it was and they say this is human rights related so we are going to count it as a human rights budget and they did that for one or two years and then they they have uh, they have forgotten all that initiative and now they don't have a, a human rights uh, approach to the budget anymore Oh dear. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. You're welcome. Can I add to this? Of course. So what, what, what is important to take away from the experience of the Mexico City government is that it is incredibly complicated to try to change the logic in which the budget is formulated. I mean, and this has happened also with gender budget initiatives all around the world. Uh, the budget is a technical instrument which is put together by technical people who do not necessarily care about or understand, let's, and let's not say care about, but understand about uh, human rights often they don't even understand about the programmatic context of the of the budgets that they are developing i mean the program people within governments speak a different language than the finance people within governments and so trying to bring these visions together is actually a very very challenging uh, um, process that eventually leads to exhaustion. I mean, in the case of Mexico City, one of the challenges is the cycle that repeats constantly, uh, which is the budget cycle, and the way of making sure that what you did the first time carries over into the second, the third, and so on. So, what I want to say in regard to this is that um, it might be easier to look at specific issues and to look at broad obligations, which is what we tried to do by focusing on Article 2, instead of trying to look at the full like context and content of human rights 
for all of the budget. That is just like an almost an impossible task and it faces these problems that I was, was pointing out. Nevertheless, if you focus on more specific issues like maternal health, which was one of the questions that was coming up, you could actually identify what it is that good human rights standards in terms of the definition of policies for maternal health would mean by looking at other documents that define this context like it is for example the the general comment on health uh, developed by the special rapporteur of health at uh, its moment or more recently looking at the technical guidance for a human rights based maternal health approach uh, which was also issued by the uh, UN in this case by the committee for human rights and I think that if you pick specific problems and look at what would be the right human rights approach for that specific issue, then it is easier to work towards human rights criteria in the budgeting of that issue. But if you want to tackle the whole big government, it, it becomes much more of a challenge because it means uprooting the way in which budgets are done and while, while systemically that might be what is needed, it will just not happen in practical terms. Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes remaining for this webinar. I'm going to read some resources that have been shared by uh, participants and then we'll uh, go ahead and grab the last um, grouping of questions. Matthew Nyamwange uh, from Kenya says, in Kenya we have the Women Enterprise Fund. It's a semi-autonomous government ag agency in the Ministry of Devolution and Planning established in August 2007 to provide accessible and affordable credit to support women to start and or expand business for wealth and employment creation. And Pia Janning says, in terms of case studies, if anyone is interested, you could also look at the Rialto Rights in Action Group in Dublin, Ireland, um, which have faced similar issues to the Seven Towers and have used human rights language to hold governments accountable. Thank you for those recommendations. We're going to... Um, I'm going to read uh, a couple more questions from the floor. If anybody else wants to uh, raise their hand, you can do that and I can put you in the queue. This question is from Matthew. In Article 2, what are the best ways to reduce unnecessary expenditure by government officials in a country, changing the theme of expenditure from recurrent to development expenditure? And a couple of questions from Karen Benziv. I'm not that familiar with the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, so I'm wondering in what form they provide spaces for additional pressure or leverage, or do you think that the um, International Covenant is most relevant where national legal frameworks are not sufficient? In what way would referring to the International Covenant would help in a place like South Africa, for example, where the Constitution already provides for progressive rights. Uh, yeah, on, on Karen's question, I mean, there's no question. I mean, if, there, if national standards are strong, um, if they're clear, if they're well articulated and, and they're strong, Absolutely, use the national standards because then you don't get into what the role of international law is in the country, then, then the national standards are more familiar to people, the courts feel more comfortable with them, etc., etc., so absolutely. But in general, that, particularly with regard to economic, social, and cultural rights, the, the standards in most countries are not that strong. Um, 
if they're not strong or they're vague. And even in a case of, for instance, South Africa, and apparently South Africa hasn't yet ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, but I think it's um, signed it. But essentially, the courts in South Africa would look to um, international law and the jurisprudence around the covenant, even if the government hasn't ratified it, to fill out, to flesh out, um, and to help make decisions in cases where, yes, I mean, the, the South African constitution is unusually strong, for instance, with regard to economic and social rights, but it's still, the language is not very full. It may guarantee right to education or the right to um, health and so on, but but that leaves a lot to the imagination in terms of what that means. And international standards um, are very useful in that regard, um, particularly in a number of the general comments that elaborate on the different um, rights that are mentioned in the covenant. They can be very helpful in terms of understanding what uh, the right to education, right to health, and so on mean. If I could just come in briefly on that point, just to uh, reiterate Please. what Anne said, um, and also um, I think this is often unarticulated maybe when we talk about um, international, um, international human rights law, but from our perspective there are two additional benefits as well of discussing international human rights law and especially the covenant um, when we're talking about national or very local issues. The first is the impact that it has on government. In our experience, governments don't like to be embarrassed by um, the outside external views or, you know, um, the, the, uh, some expert from somewhere else talking about um, the international human rights obligations that the state is under, um, which is why in our work with um, the residents we often held international hearings where we would bring international experts along and we would consistently be going to special rapporteurs or to members of the committee um, with what was happening on the ground here to make it relevant to them and to keep that pressure on the government. So from a campaigning point of view, it was very important, um, I think, in terms of changing government decision-making structures and in changing the outcomes, um, to have that external pressure which is afforded by um, international covenants. The other thing is that it, uh, very often when you're trying to make change you are um, directed to um, government personnel and very often you'll get bounced around the ranks. Um, international human rights law places the obligation on the top person in government and we have, on the government itself, and we have interpreted that to mean the minister in charge. So it elevates the position of what you're discussing to something which needs to be discussed by the top person in government or the highest levels in government, which is very useful. Um, and the last thing I would say about that um, is that from our experience in working with rights holders who are very often marginalized and disadvantaged, um, changing the nature of the conversation from one which has been about rights or been about the needs of someone to suddenly the position that they are in where they have rights and the, that the government has an obligation to them is um, really transformative in terms of that person's dignity, that person's confidence, and it goes back to the issue we were talking earlier about empowerment, how do you empower people to participate, how do you empower people to be involved in decision making around budget allocation. One of the key steps is by bringing rights into the equation because suddenly then, you know, it, it's changed the whole nature of the power dynamic, I think, and I think that's really important. Thank you very much. Um, somebody is asking if the material, if the handbook will be translated into French. I'm not sure if there's any plans to translate this, but our colleagues from West Africa talk about the relevance of having this material available in French. Uh, currently, we have plans of translating the handbook into Spanish and Portuguese. We have not any plans yet uh, for translating it into French. Uh, if there is any, uh, if anybody knows of any uh, possibility for doing so, uh, please let us know. 
Great. Um, there's one last uh, question, and then I'll leave the, the floor to Anne, Elena, and Kate to make final remarks. Um, and uh, this is from Emmanuel Camonio. Will the strategic litigation, the good strategy to ensure that governments comply with Article 2 of the International Covenant, I may quote here the maternal health petition in Uganda by the organization Sehurd. There is also a case on right to education in Uganda. Do you think where the Constitution um, if the Constitution allows, there would, this would be a favorable, favorable strategy. I'm not sure if I conveyed this as clearly as, as, um, as possible, Emmanuel. If you don't mind, I can uh, give you the, the floor so you can ask this final question. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Uh, actually, um, <clears throat> thank you very much for giving me the floor. I would like just ask uh, to just to clarify if the strategic litigation will be one way to ensure that the government comply with this Article 2. Um, I w just I w was quoting the, um, the court case on maternal health in Uganda by Seward, whereby they, will, they were trying to ensure that government uh, avail uh, more resources to ensure that they hire more midwives, they buy some um, health commodities to ensure that at the end there is reduction on maternal deaths in Uganda. As you may, may know, uh, in Uganda every day 16 women die while delivering and that was one way to ensure that government increase the budget allocated to, to health. Thank you, Emmanuel. With uh, that final question, I'll, I'll leave uh, the floor to the presenters to uh, address it in, in give us their closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, on that question, I mean, I think it definitely um, depends on the context, Emmanuel. As you yourself know, I'm sure that that um, depends on the courts in the country, depends upon um, how effective the courts are, and, and, um, and also in part how open they are to to this type of litigation. But again, even if they aren't open, that doesn't that's not the end of the question. You may want to persuade them to to listen to it. Um, but certainly, some some of the most effective organizations um, working on human rights and budgets are using strategic lit litigation. I mean, one of the um, case studies in the handbook is from ASIC in Argentina uh, around the right to education, and they use strategic litigation all the time. They use litigation um, around the, this education issue and ensuring equality in um, in the uh, spending in, in by geography in Buenos Aires to ensure that that the the poor areas of the city were getting um, equal access to education as the wealthier areas um, and I think what they have succeeded in doing um, in Buenos Aires in Argentina is um, getting the courts to actually look very closely at these budget questions. Um, budgets and human rights are not a strange combination in the courts in Argentina any longer. I see and other organizations have been very good in moving this forward and it's been they've gotten um, a series of favorable rulings um, out of the courts uh, using litigation, challenging the government's budget on human rights issues. Um, the, the challenge for them has been the follow-up and ensuring that the government follows the court order but certainly they've been, um, the litigation has proved to be very successful and also in helping set standards. Um, yeah, so that's, that would be my final say and, and um, I want to thank everybody for um, joining this and, uh, and please, um, I know that uh, I'm very happy um, to uh, take any questions by email that people might have. Elena, Kate. Um, yes, just to add to this, I mean, uh, as Anne was well saying, strategic litigation has been a very used tool by some of the organizations who are furthering um, budget arguments for the realization of rights. I see he's one of the examples. Another one which you will also find in the handbook in uh, in other of the booklets that integrated is the case of uh, attack in South Africa who um, took the 
government to the courts arguing that they had enough money to provide um, um, nev nevirapa nevaparin, which is um, this uh, medicine that avoids mother-to-child transmission of HIV and AIDS. And there the argument was that the government was basically uh, not respecting the right to life and the right to health by failing to put in place a program that could provide this life-saving uh, drug. And uh, one of the arguments was demonstrating that the government had the resources to provide that drug. So uh, budget arguments are strong pieces in strategic litigation wherever strategic litigation is uh, a, good, uh, a good route to follow, as Anne was saying. Um, and uh, as a closing remark on my side, I mean, we worked many years in order to develop these arguments and conceptually try to use Article 2 as a frame for holding the government accountable in terms of the human rights obligation through the budget. And we are uh, super excited uh, with the possibility of having these conversations with you. And I thus just was, want to remember you that this is the first of three webinars where we will be talking in each case to one of these obligations. So this one was on maximum available resources, the next one will be on non-discrimination and the last one on progressive realization. Thank you very much for joining us. Over to you, Kate. Thanks, Helena. Um, just to reiterate what Anne and Helena have both said, um, I think the government narrative on budgets will only ever change when more of us use human rights to interrogate it. So um, to that end, I suppose that I'd like to finish by thanking you for uh, um, coming along um, to this today and thank you to um, the IBP and um, Anne, Helena and Rothio for um, inviting PPR to be a part of this um, today. Certainly I found it um, very informative and please do um, you know, let this be the start of a broader conversation and keep in touch, keep in touch with us in Belfast. Um, we are certainly very interested in all of your work um, and we thank you for your, your interest in ours as well and I think the only way that, that we get better at this and the only way that um, budget analysis and human rights becomes a more central part of the dialogue that society has is that if we all learn from each other. Um, so it, it's been great to be part of today. Thank you very much. Great. Well, on behalf of the IVP, I would like to thank all of the participants who joined us today. Thank you for all your questions and enthusiasm throughout the last hour and a half. And of course, thank you to Anne, Elena, and Kate for their very inspiring and um, engaging presentations. I will follow up with uh, participants with a link um, to the recording of this webinar and of course with instructions on how to join us for the next uh, webinar next week on non-discrimination. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>